So, all right, everyone, I'd like to welcome you to our Cure 360 webinar series. Uh, my name is Jana Von Heen. I'm the Senior Director of Research and Clinical Strategy at RSRT, and I'm very pleased to um, introduce to you today Dr. Jeffrey Newell, who's joining us on this webinar entitled uh, Advances in Biosensor Development Part 1, where we'll provide you some updates from our ketamine study. And just to uh, introduce Dr. Newell, uh, Jeff Newell is an internationally recognized expert in Rett syndrome. He sees patients and conducts clinical trials in Rett syndrome and other neurodevelopmental disorders. And he also runs a basic science laboratory uh, that's aimed at understanding these disorders better. He has earned his medical and doctorate degree from the University of Chicago and completed his medical training in child neurology at Baylor College of Medicine and Texas Children's Hospital. Dr. Newell is the lead investigator and co-sponsor of the ketamine clinical trial with us at RSRT. So Jeff, thank you very much for joining us today. Um, I think it's gonna be a fun webinar. Yeah, thanks for having me come on. Sure, so I'm gonna share my screen, hopefully. So what I'd like to do today for everyone is just briefly introduce the ketamine study uh, so we can talk about what exactly we're doing, and then we can get into how we're utilizing the biosensors and what we hope to accomplish with them. So just a very brief overview of the ketamine study. Uh, the title is a randomized, double-blind, placebo-controlled crossover study where we're assessing safety and tolerability as well as efficacy of oral ketamine in patients with Rett syndrome. And so I wanna just back up a little bit and explain this. So um, a crossover study in this particular study, all patients are going to receive both ketamine as well as placebo, uh, which is uh, where this placebo control comes from. Um, it's double blind in that nobody knows which treatment the participant is receiving, not the participants, not the study staff or the study management team. And it's randomized in that the order of the treatment, whether you receive ketamine first or placebo first is totally random, it's assigned randomly. Um, and what I have here is uh, a map of all of the sites in the United States. So this study is a US-based study right now. We have six sites, which are listed here, and Dr. Suter, who we're bringing on board in Texas soon. This study is being conducted under an investigational new drug application, which means that the FDA has oversight and we report in regularly to FDA and have been working with them closely um, on, on the study design. Um, and, and as the study has, is being conducted. And so our six sites in the US, we have obviously Dr. Newell, our lead investigator at Vanderbilt, Dr. Banky in Colorado, Dr. Barry Kravis in Chicago at Rush University, Dr. Lieberman in Boston Children's Hospital, Dr. Marsh at Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, Dr. Percy at UAB Birmingham, and uh, as I mentioned, Dr. Suter, who's coming on um, soon at Baylor College of Medicine. And the individuals that are participating in our study are girls with Rett syndrome that are between, uh, that are six to 12 years of age. They're relatively healthy and on stable medication regimens, and they can't be on medications that are known to interact with ketamine or if ketamine gets added, um, that would, it would put them at an increased risk. And they have to be um, girls who have not yet started their period. So these are the participants we have in our study. And the way that we're assessing ketamine is um, we're looking at four different dose levels of ketamine. Ketamine is normally dosed IV for medical and surgical procedures, and it's given to cause anesthesia for these, for these medical and surgical procedures. The dose levels that we're working with are sub-anesthetic, so they're extremely low. They don't cause uh, anesthesia. And ketamine has been, um, was approved in 1970. So there's over 50 years of safety data associated with ketamine use. Um, and um, we are assessing four different dose levels of ketamine, um, five days of dosing twice a day, either on ketamine um, and on placebo. And so far we have uh, an ascending, do ascending dose study where we will look at the first, the lowest dose, which is here 0.75 milligrams per kilogram dose. This is our cohort number one. 0.75 milligrams per kilogram means that uh, we will dose based on patient's weight, which is standard for, for pediatric studies. 
Cohort one has actually completed. We have already completed this cohort and um, there were no safety events. And right now we're in the middle of, or towards the end actually of cohort two, which is our 1.5 milligram per kilogram cohort. We're looking for about three more patients to come into the study. And once that cohort is completed, and if it looks safe, then we'll go on to the next one, which is three milligrams per kilogram. And then once that cohort is completed, then we would go on to our final cohort, which is uh, 4.5 milligrams per kilogram. Okay, so this is how we're planning to dose in the study. So, so what do participants need to do and how are we utilizing the biosensors? So this is a very short study. There are only four visits um, and, and one phone call. And don't be um, overwhelmed by this graphic. I'm gonna walk you through it. But essentially patients come in at visit one, we confirm that they have Rett syndrome and they enter our screening period, which is between 14 to 28 days. And this is when we start collecting biosensor data at home. So patients come in for visit one, they get their biosensors, and then they start to wear those over this, this screening period. When they come in to the clinic for visit two, this is when they would actually receive a treatment. And so patients come in to the clinic on visit two, which is begins the first part of this treatment one um, period, and they'll receive either ketamine or placebo in the clinic that day. And then they'll dose um, that treatment five days, twice a day for five days. And then we just observe them for the rest of this 14 day period. And the biosensors are being worn during this time and we're hopefully collecting data um, on, on how this treatment is, uh, is impacting symptoms. And then when they come back for uh, visit three, this is when the clinicians and the parents will kind of assess how do they think symptoms have changed over time during this treatment period. And then they will receive their uh, alternate treatment. So patients who received ketamine in this first treatment period will then switch over or cross over to receive placebo in the second treatment period. And those who received placebo first will then switch over to receive ketamine. And then this second treatment period is just a repeat of what we did um, in treatment period one, where they'll dose with the second treatment for five days, twice a day. And then there, we observe them for uh, a 14 day period. And again, the biosensors are on board here. So we're able to collect data um, on their symptoms. Uh, and then we can do a comparison essentially from what happens in this treatment period to what happened in this treatment period. When patients come back for visit four, this is when that, uh, the, that treatment period is assessed by the clinicians and the parents. And then two weeks later, there's a follow-up phone call just to uh, check on any safety events um, and make sure there's nothing that needs to be followed up. Um, once all of the patients have completed that cohort, so every patient in the, in the cohort receives whatever dose level that is, we have an independent safety review committee that then looks at all of the safety data. And if they see no safety concerns, we get the green light to initiate the next cohort. And this has already happened. We did cohort one, had no safety concerns. We're almost through cohort two. Um, and we'll do another safety review committee before we open cohort three and again for cohort four. If for some reason we did see a safety concern, we would just go ahead and, and complete the study at that point. There would be no more um, patients that would dose. Okay, so how exactly are we assessing efficacy in the study? And, and this gets at you know, why the biosensors are important. So in addition to assessing safety, we also wanna look at ketamine's impact on symptoms. And um, typically this is done by questionnaires or scales. And this isn't unique to our our uh, ketamine study in RET patients, this is pretty standard for most neurological disorders in general. And questionnaires or, or scales, these are subjective measures in that they're um, questionnaires or scales that are completed by someone else, by a clinician, by a parent or a caregiver, in some cases by the patient themselves, but it's dependent on interpretation of symptoms. And usually it's interpretation either in the moment, what's happening right now, or how do you think things have, ha have um, what do you think symptom severity has been over the last week or two weeks or four weeks? So it's, it's a summary, um, but it's kind of a snapshot in time. How do you feel about it right now? And this is the standard way that efficacy is assessed in most clinical trials in, in neuro neurological disorders. Now what biosensors do is they uh, give us an, a new opportunity to, to assess safety in a completely different way. And so biosensors measure something directly in the patient um, that's objective and is not, uh, does not require interpretation by someone else. 
Um, and it also allows you to collect continuous data rather than having a questionnaire that was done at you know, one specific time point. You have um, the ability now through these different biosensors to collect physiological data in the home for several days, several hours. Um, and it, it leads to um, a probably a, a more comprehensive um, assessment of how those patients' uh, symptoms really are. And so this opens up new avenues for being able to detect efficacy in clinical trials. And it's something that we're trying to develop to get into clinical trials um, going forward for Rett syndrome. Okay, and so the biosensor we're gonna talk about today, um, this is it, this is called the Hexoskin Smart Garment. It is a uh, tank top that has um, different sensors embedded in it. And it can detect breathing, which you can see here, this is what a breath would look like on a data stream. It can also detect heart rate and provide something that looks like this, which is a standard ECG signal we're probably all aware of. Um, it can also detect movement. It has accelerometers in it. Uh, and so it can also detect position as well as sleep. And so there's a number of different physiological act, um, activities that we can learn about in Rett syndrome, whether patients are on treatment or not through this device. Um, and I think uh, with that, what I wanna do is we're just gonna focus on breathing for today. But at this point, I just wanna turn it over to Jeff um, and let him give us some background on why we're looking at breathing dysfunction in Rett syndrome and, um, and why we think ketamine is going to be, could potentially impact that. On mute, okay, thanks Jenna. <laughs> uh, so, um, uh, this is a boring slide that just has a bunch of the papers that are referenced to, but it, it sets up the stage. It sets the stage for the kind of work that we're doing in the ketamine trial. And really, you know, we've known for a long time um, clinically that there are these breathing abnormalities in people with Rett syndrome. But as uh, Jenna was saying, most of that is sort of a clinical impression. We see somebody in the clinic and we sort of give them a little scale from like one to five of how bad their breath holding or their breath or hyperventilation is in the clinic. Or we ask families similar types of questions, but it's this very instantaneous and snapshot and it's kind of a, you know, a, it's not, it's a kind of not a nice quantitative, me you know, measured exactly. Um, and we know that, you know, if you do some more detailed measurements, you can actually get more precise things. And some of the information and probably the thing that really set up how we're approaching this study was work by uh, Debbie Wiesmeyer and Nino Ramirez. Um, and these are some of the papers. And in, in the mid 2000s, they collected 47 people with Rett syndrome um, and uh, then unaffected siblings. Um, who were two to seven years old, and they recorded using something that at the time was called a life shirt. And it's actually very, very similar. The hexaskin is almost like the, the generation. Life shirt went out of business, and so hexaskin, though, does the same kind of things. It's measuring the breathing from what's called a band plus osmography, the bands around it, and it measures the uh, electrocardiograms. This also, the hexaskin, as Jenna mentioned, also can measure movement position. So the Debbie Wiesmeyer, though, did collect this, and that was some of the first time of really using these at-home measurements of breathing in people with Rett syndrome, and they were able to show that there were specific breathing abnormalities like the hyperventilation and the breath holding, and also differences in how the breathing and the heart rate um, interacted with each other, both during uh, when the children were awake, when we think there's more more predominance of this, but they actually showed that at nighttime, they actually could still also see these abnormalities. So it wasn't that they went all the way away. And they've recently been analyzing this data, again, from back 15 years ago um, to uh, do a little more detailed thing. Now, when they did this study, I'm just, I'm sorry, I'm talking a lot about this, but it, it really does, it's important to understand. When they did it, they had, these people who were two to seven years old record for um, one night and then a two hour period uh, during the day. Okay, so that's just the backdrop of um, the use of these type of devices um, to try to measure breathing and, and how there is some evidence in Rett syndrome to be able to do this. Now, the, in, in the trial with ketamine, which is based on animal work, starting with um, work from David Cass's group that showed that um, by giving animals who have MECP2 mutations and uh, that model Rett syndrome, giving them ketamine, 
it normalized the activity of the brain across the brain. Um, and they did this measurement by actually cutting up the mouse brains and measuring specific readouts of activity. Um, that le led to uh, Michaela Frangelini uh, doing a, a trial in the animals to look to see how it affect their behavior. And they showed that this chronic treatment of um, ketamine um, improved a number of different things in these mice that lacked MECP2 function. And specifically, it improved their breathing. It reduced the amounts of the breath holding. So we can measure these things like breathing in the mice pretty well. Um, and they do reproduce what we see in people with Rett syndrome with um, breath holds or, or breath pauses and then high, high periods of breathing too. And the treatment in, in the animals improved that. So that's one of the reasons why when we designed this study, which is using different doses and kind of making sure it's safe as a primary goal, but we wanted to include things that it, the animals that we saw in the animal, that were seen in the animals. And one of them is obviously the breathing. So we, that's why we incorporated the hexaskin. So you can go to the next slide, please. Good. So as uh, Jenna was mentioning, um, you know, this is the, the hexa skin. We've incorporated this into the ketamine trial because we can use that to assess um, the effects on breathing of ketamine potentially. So again, the breath holds, how the periods of time that they're breathing fast, the periods of time that they're shallow breathing and other irregularities in the um, breathing pattern. And this is being analyzed by a, a thing called VioSense data analytic platform. Um, one thing, though, that is important to understand, too, about this. Oh, let, yeah, let's go to the development panel. That's the next um, slide. So, um, so the goal then, you know, obviously this ketamine trial, as Jenna outlined, has particular goals about looking at the efficacy of uh, the safety primarily of, of ketamine, but trying to see if there's any signals of efficacy. But built in this is basically an analysis of our ability to do these biosensors with this hexo scan um, to see how well we can capture the data. Um, so that's the feasibility. Can, you know, yeah, can people wear it? Can the families put it on and take it off? Do people, do they tolerate, do the children tolerate wearing this for extended periods of time? Um, can it identify these periods of fast breathing and breath hold? So as I said, although this is very, very similar to the life shirt that Deborah Wiesmeyer used, it's not the same thing. And so we need to make sure that we can also get data off, off of this. Um, and can we quantify it and look at it over time? Um, and then ultimately, since we're doing this treatment trial, is do we see any effects from the treatment from itself? Um, so that would let us get a start getting a sense of how useful will this kind of measure about this biosensor itself be useful in clinical trials. Now, some of the things that I think are important to um, explain that are different from the trials that are the, the studies that I mentioned before from Deborah Wiesmeyer, um, again, besides it being not exactly the same device, even though functionally it's very, very similar. Um, in the Deborah Wiesmeyer group, that was two to seven year olds. And if you remember the, the age range for um, this is six to 12 year old. So we, we actually are getting a different age range of people with Rett syndrome. And I think that's really important um, because obviously we wanna make sure that something like this is gonna work over a broad range. Second of all, we actually know that the breathing abnormalities seem to keep increasing, especially during the school age years, like the six to 12 years, it seems to be more prominent. The other is that we're going to actually we are we're collecting data for a much much longer period for each person. So um, we're actually collecting it continuously for you know weeks before the trial and then weeks during the trial. You know, and some of those times we're um, on placebo or on drug and then sometimes off. And so what that is important about is that we can start understanding um, how how consistent is that data across time in a person, right? So does, and that, that itself gets us an understanding of how much variability is there in terms of breathing abnormalities in people with Rett syndrome over day to day to day. Because people, families will always tell us, oh, 
today's a bad day and she's having much worse breathing problems than yesterday it was a good day. So this lets us get a sense of how much we can detect those kind of things. So I think that this is really important because this will really extend um, our understanding of the use of these type of sensors in a way um, that will provide us a much richer data set that hopefully we can build off the stuff that Debbie Wiesmeyer has done and the kind of an analytic methods, but then extend it to a device that we're current, it's currently available now and show the feasibility of using it in a clinical trial or as a putative outcome measure. I, we're not trying to say this is an outcome at this point, but that would be the goal of something like this. I think that's all we really had to cover, Jenna. Is there something else you wanted to go to? No, that was great. Um, Thank you. And what I wanted to do now is just open it up for questions from our audience and just see if there um, was anybody, anything anybody wanted to ask. So you can just type right into the, into um, the Q&A or the chat, I think, and we can um, address any questions that anybody has. Just give people a minute. Yeah, so this has been a really fun study to work with all of the RET clinicians on. And, um, you know, this isn't the only biosensor that we're developing. There are others that we're interested in developing as well. And, and really the hexaskin was one of the ones that rose to the top uh, when we kind of did a, a broad search of what types of biosensors could we potentially develop in RET. And this is one of the ones that was most comprehensive, uh, measured the most um, number of different things. And so, you know, now what we want to do is kind of march through and just decide, you know, based on the data that it provides, the ease of use from families, is it something that we could get into clinical trials to improve the way efficacy is, is assessed? Mm -hmm. And so this has been a really fun project to work on. Um, and we've started mapping out, you know, how are we going to analyze this data? And so we have a question here. Um, so if we're interested in having our child participate in the study, who do we contact? So that's a great question. So um, you can reach out to me. I can um, put you in touch with the closest site um, and then they can follow up with you uh, to see if you're eligible, if your family is eligible, um, that would be the easiest thing. But um, yeah, we're still enrolling in this study. Um, so if there's plenty of room if people would like to join, we would like to try to finish the study this year so we can get to this biosensor analysis and really um, be able to see you know, what this device can do and if it's worth um, developing further. All right, we have a second question here. So what improvements in breathing were noted in mouse models that you were hoping will translate to the girls? Jeff, yeah, specifically, yeah, specifically what was noted in the mouse models was a decrease in the in the breath pauses. And, and that's the most that's really the most one of the most robust things we see in the mouse models is that they have periods where they stop breathing and the ketamine um, had a had its biggest effect on that. And so that's exactly why we wanted to have a measure of breathing and something that we thought was gonna be able to capture the breath pauses. And we thought the hexaskin could do that. Great. So there's one more question here. I can't quite, um, looks like there, I can't quite understand. It looks like there was some. I think it says, uh, is there, yeah, yeah mistype, but it asks about the ret mutations being more or less interesting. So I will, um, interpret and you can type in again, if you have something wrong, but it, maybe the question is, is there any reason to believe that one type of mutation in, in MECP2 um, might be uh, more susceptible um, to uh, the drug than another mutation? And we don't know, it's a really good question. We don't know. Um, we don't have any reason to believe that it isn't, but the, the animal work was only done in one model of one of the mouse models. And that's the one that um, eliminates essentially almost all of the gene. So it, it was not done in some of the newer mouse models that have been created that have those specific point mutations put into the mouse. So it is a very, very good question. We don't know, we don't have any uh, reason to believe that it would be different but it still is a good question. Great. All right. Well, I don't see any additional questions coming in. Um, and there isn't really anything else that I need to share. Jeff, do you have any um, anything else for our audience before we close the webinar? 
Uh, no, no, no. I, I'm just, I'm excited to uh, see us get this information together because uh, again, I think obviously there's lots of goals of this trial, but you know, as we are presenting here, I think um, there's this, there's an ancillary goal that is this just developing these bio, biosensors. And that's really critical for us to be able to do effective clinical trials. And it's something that I think we have to put a lot more effort into um, moving forward. Yes, for sure. Um, oh, so there's just two more questions really quick. I think we can just address before we sign off here. So right now, this is a strictly US trial. Um, patients that are abroad could potentially participate if they could make the study visits. Um, but I think that's that's a discussion that you would need to have as you know your family with the with the study team to see if that's something feasible and um, you're willing to take whatever risks are associated with travel things like that. Um, and then um, I can follow up with you, um, Mr. Glick, with my email. Um, I can get that from Monica. I can email you directly, and we can follow up um, in getting you in touch with the site. So, okay, if there aren't any other questions, I just wanted to thank everybody for joining today. Um, we are gonna do a follow-up to this webinar that will address the other biosensors that we're currently developing at Boston Children's Hospital. So I just wanted to thank Dr. Newell for joining us today for your expertise in Rett syndrome and the biosensors and thank our audience for attending. Thanks guys, have a wonderful rest of your day.